So I, I hear you've been getting out a little bit. That you went to Fanny's house over the weekend? Yeah, yeah I have been uh, getting around. I mean, I'm, the only thing that concerns me is the virus. Well. I mean, you can get that if you're 100% healthy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there is no question that it's still still there, still yeah. virulent. Uh, and you, I think it's wise to be cautious, but it also, you know, you have to live a life to some extent. Oh, of course. You know, get out. So yes, I, heard you, I heard you even went out to dinner the other night. Pardon? I heard you even went out to dinner the yeah, other night. Did. That must have been nice. Well, I'm slowly getting back into the real world. I've Good. been sitting here forever. Well, at least it's a comfortable chair. Yeah. <laughs> and once I saw that, I could never look at Marlon Brando the same way again. I always saw Marlon Brando through Mort's eyes. Uh, and, and it's just, I mean, I just... Well, my, likely I've been looking at your and you're going to have the same effect on me. Well, you know, I, I tell you, you know, I, I realized it was one thing to draw famous people, you know, movie stars, yeah. because you're not drawing the person there, you're drawing the persona that the public knows. Right, the, pers the personality. And... The first real test that I had after Mad moved away was when you know Mick, Nick Meglin died, and Susie at Mad asked me to draw a portrait of Nick for the magazine, and I had to say I, I have to draw the Nick I knew. Oh. And it for me it was like, yeah. You know this was this this was a Mount Everest for me. And uh, uh, I remember I did a whole bunch of sketches. I showed Diane, and I said, do any of these resonate with you? Do they work? And she said, that one. Uh -huh. And that became the basis of my drawing. Oh, fantastic. And you know, I tell people this, and it, it's kind of a joke, but it kind of isn't, is that the entire time I was working on it, I felt like Nick was staring over my shoulder saying, excuse me, don't fuck it up, Viviano. <laughs> no, but you've always walked that way. Well, that was more intense, though. You know, it was, and it was nice to know that even at that point in my life, I could be learning something by what I was doing. But, you know, why did you become the art editor of Mad Magazine? Oh, they were desperate. <laughs> I no, I, I, I enjoyed working <coughs> with you, Rick, man, because you solved all my problems. <laughs> not, not <laughs> that I mean, you, you would be the only one that I could rely on. I mean, Nick would come in and give his opinion of, of my drawing. And uh, he, he would focus on the most unimportant parts, <laughs> but you would just find the exact spot, a part that needs adjusting. Well, I was, that made it work. I was talking with Doug about this: is that the goal is always not to get in the way of the artist, yeah. but to help the artist achieve what he's trying to do. That's what made you so good to work with. I, uh, I just had no uh, anxiety about bringing my work to you because you could change it 100% and it's going to get better. Well. I, I always felt that working with you was a wonderful collaboration because you were so open to collaboration. Oh, yeah. Because not every artist is. You know? So I, I was telling Doug about this, that some yes, artists sure. I would make a suggestion and they get very defensive. Yes. Like I was trying to get in their way. Yeah. And... I uh, never had that problem with you. No, no. When you... Even something as simple as saying... Uh, these two figures are a little too far apart, just move them closer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that 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 was one of my strengths as an art director because I had been working as an illustrator for so long yeah. that I was looking to say how can you do this and and what are the mechanics of it you know that that it's not I don't like it it's how can it be better okay. yeah that's the most intelligent as in point of view that I've heard you got that I did. I did get how, that. That's how intelligent I yeah. am. <laughs> yes. Well, that, there are so many people who are in positions of power, but they don't know what that power is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just uh, think in terms of maybe this guy should be on the left side. It might look better. I mean, that's not an art criticism. Yeah. Well. It's it's making it better. What what did you tell me on the on the bus? It was you know your your job was more to make it communicate. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, what are you trying to do, and and have you achieved what you're trying to do? And if not, how can I help you achieve it? That was always what I saw as my job. Yeah, uh, I I that has run through my mind many times and that's why I come back to saying that you were for me the perfect uh, editor because it was instantaneous you would say move them this way and this way and I, I immediately in my imagination could see that that was better than what I had now the thing you have to understand uh, is that that scenario happened very rarely. Usually it was, Sam, here's the sketch. Al, that's really great. Do the finish. That was, that was my art direction. <laughs> well, we did work together very well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some people naturally gravitated, some writers, to, to the continuities, the, the movie and TV parodies. Uh, obviously Stan Hart and um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of someone else who basically, Arnie Kogan. Um, there are some who had really broad portfolios, could pretty much do any kind of humorous writing. I mean, Frank Jacobs is the best example of that, but, but Al's also in that boat because when you look at the great variety of stuff that Al did, um, but I don't know that a TV or movie parody came quite as naturally to Al as it might have to Stan Hart or to Dick D. Bartolo. You know, Dick's another one who has a broad portfolio. He did a lot of movie and TV parodies, but did you know, ad parodies and, and other things. Um, so I, I, you know, I I don't know for sure about this. It might have even been at a time when they wanted to do Bullet, and the guys who normally did that stuff weren't available, you know? That's how I got to do certain movie parodies. Um, when Titanic came out, it, nobody thought it was a hit at first, because it was this big, lumbering movie, three hours and something long, and it went over budget, and, and it was late in being released, and everyone thought it was going to be a big uh, flop. So Mort Drucker and, and Angelo Torres were busy doing other movies and TV shows, and then they suddenly realized this movie is getting big. So I got to illustrate it, you know? Yeah. The third stringer got in. <laughs> when I was working for Will Eisner, uh -huh. uh, he wanted to put me on doing what you guys were doing, uh -huh. which is go to a movie and come back and do, do the layout and show it to it. Mm -hmm. But I declined because I don't, I really don't have that kind of talent. Uh, you know, you have to, if you're gonna satirize a movie or a ball game or, you know, something that's spread out all over, place. You, you have to have a 
certain kind of receptive talent where you just absorb the the high points yes. and don't focus on the low points. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just I was I was amused by people in the audience. <laughs> Yes, I could see that. You would go to a movie and you'd write something about the audience. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. I, 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 the kick I got was of being in that world. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing I think about you, Al. Is, and we've talked about this. That Al is a tinkerer. And so much of what you have done involves some kind of invention whether it's an article about inventions that you come up with or the invention of the fold-in. And each, each fold-in is an invention. You're creating something that wasn't there before. It's this mechanical it's thing mechanical. that very, very appealing right. to young boys, too, and girls, but very, but very, very appealing to a, yes. people coming up. I think that, you know, along with Don Martin, I'll say, in my own, my own personal thing that brought me into the magazine was a lot of Al's inventiveness. Sure. And I think that, you know, you could even consider uh, um, uh, snappy answers a kind of tinkering. You know, uh, what's the best answer that goes with this stupid question? So it becomes a kind of machine in a way. Yeah. Uh, and I think Al just hit the nail on the head. You go to a movie, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to recap the movie. He wants to see what's going on around the movie. <laughs> People I've admired for years, and they just stopped being creative. They, they just polished mm. what they did years ago. Uh, and I probably did the same thing in, in the fall then. Well, I, I always thought that one of the amazing things about the fall then was that it was the same thing every issue. But totally different every issue. That you know, it was always a different question, a different problem, and even mechanically, even though they all folded in the same way, the way things lined up, the way you hid things, were different. So well, you know, it was the challenge of creativity yeah. is what has driven most of us all our lives, and. When you when you hit it, it's like hitting a home run. Yeah. You feel so good. Yeah. Did you ever have that sensation when you were working on something that you got so involved in it you almost like went into a trance? Yeah. And then the end of the day or the next day you look at it and say, Did I do that? <laughs> because yeah, you know, that happened to me a number of times over well, the years. Well, I've looked at your work. <laughs> And it puts everybody in a I trance. I, <laughs> I saw that in s some of the newer stuff, your influence. Well, that'd be nice if, if, to think I influenced, but I hope for the better. That cover of Mad is fascinating. Yeah, well, I was... It requires a bit of intelligence. Well... Mark Fredrickson, you know, I worked with him a long time, I mean, over 20 years, and I don't know anyone who got more involved in each piece he was working on. We would get, you know, I would, we would put together a sketch, and an idea for him, send it to him. And then once he started working on it, he, he was so obsessive. He'd send us, now he was working digitally on the computer. So he would send us like a comp that he'd put together, but it looked like a finished piece of work. And we'd say, okay, uh, this is good, this needs to be changed, yada, yada. And a couple hours later, he'd send us another one. And before we had time to finish talking about that one, he'd send us another one. Oh, God. And he would work, even after we said, this is great, finish it up. He'd keep working on it and send us more and say, I changed this. Is it, you like this better? And there's at least one example where 
We said, okay, this is the final one, Mark. You're done. We're going to send it to the printer. And this is on a Friday. On Monday morning, we get something in the in email. He said, I changed it. Is it too late? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, we sent it to the printer on Friday. And that was the oil slick cover, wasn't it? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think you talked about that in the book. I did, yeah. That, yeah. I, that was the thing I picked as my... Yeah. yeah. The poo looking like like hot dogs. <laughs> you know, how did that come about? The pooper scooper? Do you well, well the, the, the decision so that you got to make this palatable and, and printer friendly at the time. You know, you couldn't have dog poop. Well, once again, I'm going to speak for Al in just the sense that everything Al put his hands to was with the goal of how can I make this funny? And to just draw a turd isn't funny. To make it look like a hot dog is funny. <laughs> well, that's that's the heart. Yeah. The heart of the business we're in is that you can start out with a very serious subject like atomic bombs. But then you you go over to the side and you picture what the average person is doing while atomic bombs are falling. Yeah. So you can come up with stuff that's funny. Uh, just showing in art form the frustration of building protection against an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you have to keep it within boundaries. Yeah. As you, you know better than I do, you've seen more of it. Yeah. I, I've always felt that was the job of the editor, in the sense that the writer comes up with all these ideas, and the editor says, this one works, this one doesn't. You did that with me. Well, as a, uh, on the art level, right. But I'm talking about the writing level. You know, that, that here's a gag that sings. Great. Here's one that falls flat. Mm. Here's one, maybe it could be a little better. Maybe, yeah. maybe if you switch it around, yeah. you know, and, and put the, the object first and the... Uh, and, that's what, you know, nowadays everybody puts stuff up on the internet and they don't have editors editing them. No. And I've always loved having somebody tell me this is good or this could be better. Oh, yeah. As opposed to my own opinion, which is going to be one of two things. This is super great or this is horrible. You know, you never, you never, and that's the other thing I was going to talk about. Uh, Thank God for deadlines, because I would continue tinkering with some something and noodling it and trying to make it better. A deadline says you got to be done at yep. some point. Yep. You know, don't don't get so involved that you're polishing the stone. You know. Yeah. It's well. It it comes down to focus. Yeah. Uh. Do you want to kill your gag or your, or your story by coming up with something clever that has nothing to do with it? Right. <laughs> right. Well, that's always an issue. You yeah. know, um, Willie, more than anybody, started the tradition of, of uh, chicken fat, you know, yeah. putting all the little gags in the yeah. background. And I can't tell you how many artists I've worked with who wanted to be Willie Elder, and they put all these gags, but the gags wouldn't work because they either were so unrelated to the main material that they were distracting from the main material. And he had to say, you know, you have to be judicious about what you put in there. Oh, of course. You know? what, what, you're, what you're talking about is a stand-up comic who has a whole thing which you know, has a story on. Right. And he's not going to be successful if he 
if the storyline uh, pulls out an idea that he can go in another direction. Right, yeah. And and you see that happen. Yeah, where they, they go on to a, a tangent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You get lost. You think that what the worst part of it is the audience is sitting there suddenly starts to think, I liked him up to this point, but now he's, he's getting into his own life. Well, of course, that was the thing about MAD, was we didn't have enough space to allow that kind of yeah. going off on, on digressions. Yeah. So each gag had to be right to the point. Uh, and that, once again, I think was the editor's job and then the artist and the art director working together to make sure that the gag doesn't get lost, you know, the forest for the trees. The thing that always fascin fascinated me when I found out about it was that you started with a full, unfolded image. And, that be and then it became the folded image. He didn't even get a chance to see it. No, completed. Kyle never saw his his artwork folded in until the magazine came out. That's fascinating. Well, that's because Al was working in an analog fashion. And I, I, I don't know, I think that Johnny is working in paints still, but he has the advantage that he could scan it in and fold it in and say, okay, I need to fix this or that or the other thing. Um, but anyway, you, know, you, you never saw a fold and fold it in until it was in print. Mm -hmm. Any any surprises that you can recall? Oh man, how why did that turn well, out I, that way? Some I was I was very disappointed with myself <laughs> because it was you know I, either I did it or or I made a sketch and misled somebody. Uh, but on the whole, the foldings have been okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Even if I say so myself. <laughs> From my um, point of view, um, there may have been really like minor things, like maybe the lines didn't match yes. up perfectly, or the colors were slightly off, yeah. but not enough ever to change the idea. Not enough to say, what is that supposed to be? The idea is number one. Yeah, right, right, right. Drawing. You see the date on it? I had it somewhere else. It's a 2001. After Joyce passed away, I wanted to be able to wake up and see her. It's it's nicely framed too. Yeah. So that's 2002, right? It's, I think 2001. 2001. Al turned 70 years old in 2001. No, 80. Al turned 80 years old in 2001, and Joyce was 70. And they had a big birthday party at the Society of Illustrators. I remember that very well. And that was my birthday gift to them. Uh, that is a beautiful piece of work. Well, thank you, Al. Thank you. I, it, it, it's meaningful to me because of that history, that it was a gift to you and to Joyce from my heart and my right hand. Uh, you, I, I look at it every day and you've got Joyce's personality into the drawing. And uh, that's the hardest thing to do.